Philippine President Duterte is infamous for his brutal war on drugs. Now his critics fear he's returning the country to the dark days of dictatorship. Our world, Philippines democracy in danger, tomorrow at 9.30 p.m. on the BBC News Channel. When the weather can't decide what to do, you still can. To know what's coming, check the BBC Weather app. Welcome to BBC News, broadcasting to viewers in North America and around the globe. My name is Martin Stanford. Our top stories. Indonesia's relief and recovery operations struggle to reach the epicentre of the earthquake and survivors of a tsunami which has so far claimed more than 400 lives. A race against time. Search and rescue teams in Palu say they've managed to save 28 people, but more are trapped under the rubble of a hotel. After a controversial month, Elon Musk agrees to stand down as chairman of the electric car maker Tesla and pay a $20 million fine. Thousands of Brazilians protest against Jair Bolsonaro, the presidential candidate who denies his campaign has stoked racist and sexist support. And we have a special report from eastern Russia and the home village of one of the men suspected to be involved in the Novichok poisoning in the UK. Welcome to BBC News. Strong aftershocks have continued to hit the Indonesian island of Sulawesi, where an earthquake and tsunami on Friday killed hundreds of people. The Indonesian vice president has warned the number killed could rise to thousands. Over 400 are known to have died just in the city of Palu. Rescuers have yet to reach the neighbouring coastal district of Dongala, which is home to 300,000 people. Simon Clemerson has the latest. It is the view now from the air which gives you a true sense of the power of this earthquake. A shopping centre buckled. A road bridge laid to waste. And what about the damage beyond here in outlying areas? That picture is still not clear. The earthquake also triggered a tsunami which brought waves 10 feet high into Palu. A mobile phone captures the moment and a glimpse of the panic. There was a warning, but there wasn't long to get to higher ground, not before a packed city was quickly inundated. <laughs> With strong aftershocks, people have been urged to move away from their homes. Outside the hospital, patients are having to be treated in the open too. The devastation has also made it difficult to get aid in, but the airport has now reopened. Meanwhile, the search is on for survivors, rescuers today hunting through the ruins of a hotel. But one charity has warned that this crisis may only be getting worse. Simon Clemerson, BBC News. 
Olya Ariani is a spokesman for the Red Cross in Jakarta. A short time ago, she told me what she'd heard from her team in the affected area. Our team finally has reached uh, Palu this early in this morning because the communication access slightly restored in Palu. And now the rescue team from the Red Cross, also from the Army and Search and Rescue and also local disaster mitigation agency is now focusing on evacuating affected people who might be still trapped under the collapsed building and also giving first aid to injured people. That is the first main focus of uh, our response. And from what your team could tell you, are enough people there to help? Sorry? Are there enough emergency workers and military people there to help the citizens of Palu? Yes, uh, we work together with the Army and Search and Rescue. And like uh, I explained earlier, that we are now focusing on evacuating affected people because there are still a lot of people uh, that still could be trapped under the collapsed building and the uh, debris. And um, like uh, this morning, my, uh, my team also uh, mentioned that some of the dead people are still uh, need to be evacuated because some of the dead people are still lying on the street in some area. Um, and there is simply aren't the people, I suppose, the emergency workers to deal with that. May I ask you about another area we, we, which is even more populated, and that's Dongala, which we've been talking about uh, in our reports. Uh, it is feared, isn't it, that the disaster there could be on an even bigger scale? Yeah, so uh, according to uh, information from our team, they haven't reached Dongala yet because the road to Dongala is much a little bit harder to access. Some of the roads to Dongala and Palu are covered by building rubble and fallen trees, but uh, they have this uh, hope that this road can be still passed through despite of these blockades, but still cannot get through to uh, Dongala. And what sort of conditions are your team having to deal with in terms of is the power out? Is there a difficulty getting power? And what about petrol supplies for vehicles? Yes, yeah, so according to the uh, National Disaster Agency, the power is still off, uh, but the communication is slightly restored in Palu. And also with the uh, fuel, we have a difficulty to have uh, fuel because uh, there are full shortage now in Palu, and to get fuel, we have to drive like three to four hours to other city called Mamuju. It's in another part of Sulawesi. It's in West Sulawesi. So yeah, it's we have a lack of fuel in Palu also. Ali Arani, thank you for that update. Elon Musk, the head of the electric car maker Tesla, has agreed to stand down as chairman of the company and pay a $20 million fine to settle his dispute with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. The case stems from a tweet by Mr. Musk in August, saying that he wanted to take the company back into private hands. Tesla will also pay a fine of $20 million. Lebo de Secco has more. He's known for pushing boundaries when it comes to tech innovation, leading the way on electric cars and space exploration. But now it seems Elon Musk has pushed too far. In August, he tweeted saying he would take Tesla back into private ownership at a price of $420 a share. And crucially, he said he had the funding secured. The stock market regulator said that was false and misleading, and so they charged him. We allege that Musk had arrived at the price of $420 by assuming a 20% premium of what Tesla's then existing share price and then rounding up to $420 because of the significance of that number in marijuana culture and his belief that his girlfriend would be amused by it. And as we have said before in connection with other matters, neither celebrity status nor reputation as a technological innovator provide an exemption from the federal securities laws. Trailblazer or not, Musk has tested shareholder patience recently with antics like smoking marijuana in an interview. And he's being sued for libel after making allegations against one of the Thai cave rescuers. Things could have been much worse for Musk. The regulator had wanted to remove him as CEO as well. He'll now stay on in that position while stepping down as chairman. But with the company's image so closely linked to his own, investors might be wondering if that is a good thing. Lebu Diseko, BBC News. 
Women across Brazil are taking part in protests against the far-right front-runner in next week's presidential elections. Jair Bolsonaro, who was released earlier from hospital after being stabbed, is leading the opinion polls. The BBC's South America correspondent, Katie Watson, is in Rio de Janeiro. It's not just women on this march. Partners, children, babies have also come along for support. Everybody's wearing a badge saying, Ellie now, not him. Some people are wearing t-shirts saying, I only vote for people who respect me. Marches are taking place across Brazil as well as abroad. It started with a Facebook group asking for people to come out onto the streets. In a matter of weeks, the Facebook page has grown to nearly 4 million members. People here are angry. Mr. Bolsonaro is most famous for his comments about a congresswoman saying she didn't deserve to be raped, she was ugly. That said, Mr. Bolsonaro has a lot of support. He's expected to win the most votes in the first round. He's a politician that his supporters say will change Brazil. This country is deeply divided. The FBI has started its investigation of sexual misconduct allegations against President Trump's nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court, Brent Kavanaugh. A lawyer for Deborah Ramirez, the second woman to bring the accusations, said his client had been approached by FBI agents and has agreed to be interviewed. The U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee has approved Mr. Kavanaugh's nomination, but a full Senate vote has been delayed pending the outcome. Mr. Kavanaugh vigorously denies the allegations against him. President Trump touched on the controversy at a rally in West Virginia. On Thursday, the American people saw the brilliant and really incredible character, quality and courage of our nominee for the United States Supreme Court, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. A vote to confirm Judge Kavanaugh is a vote to confirm one of the most accomplished legal minds of our time, a jurist with a sterling record of public service. You know, for 10 years, he's a young guy, but for 10 years they've been talking about him, longer than that. I didn't know him, but I've heard about him a lot because they were all saying he should be on the United States Supreme Court. That's why I put him up. And, and I will tell you, I will tell you, I will tell you, he has suffered. A woman in the far east of Russia has told the BBC she recognises one of the key suspects in the Salisbury Novichok attack as a decorated military officer. The BBC travelled across six time zones east of Moscow to a village to verify research carried out by the Bellingcat investigative website, which this week published what it claims is the true identity of one of the suspects. While Russia continues to deny any involvement in the poisoning, we went to Beryozovka, the first television crew to visit the village. Our Moscow correspondent Sarah Rainsford reports. In the far east of Russia, along its border with China, we went searching for clues to the Salisbury poisoning. That journey led to this tranquil village, almost 5,000 miles from Moscow. It's where a Russian military intelligence officer, Anatoly Chapiga, grew up. This week, the investigative team at Bellingcat suggested that Colonel Chapiga, seen here, is the true identity of a key suspect in the Salisbury attack. British officials haven't disputed that. That suspect is now calling himself Ruslan Bashirov. So our team showed those pictures to residents in Colonel Chapiga's old village. Some didn't know him. Those who did were nervous of our camera. We agreed they'd remain anonymous. Is this on? It's him, but much older. And this woman identified the man wanted by British police as Anatoly Chapiga. I know where his parents used to live. He was a military man, an officer. He fought in war zones. Then he was in Moscow. The Chapiga family are hard to find. At the firm founded by his father, staff refused to comment. The family moved some years ago. And when I called the last phone number linked to his parents, the man who picked up said he was Uzbek and bought the SIM card on the street. The line was then disconnected. 
Just two weeks ago, President Putin himself insisted both of the Salisbury suspects were civilians. Nothing suspicious, he said, nothing criminal. On Friday, his spokesman said the Kremlin won't discuss what he called informal investigations into the poisoning any further. But the questions over Russia's explanations and the true identity of these men are only mounting. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Moscow. Stay with us on BBC World News. Still to come, the big clear-up in Greece after Mediterranean cyclone Zorbas brings flash flooding and high winds. In all Russia's turmoil, it has never come to this. President Yeltsin said the day would decide the nation's destiny. The nightmare that so many people have feared for so long is playing out its final act here. Russians are killing Russians in front of a grandstand audience. It was his humility which produced affection from Catholics throughout the world. But his departure is a tragedy for the Catholic Church. Israel's right-winger Ariel Sharon visited the religious compound and that started the trouble. He wants Israel alone to have sovereignty over the holy sites, an idea that's unthinkable to Palestinians. After 45 years of division, Germany is one. In Berlin, a million Germans celebrate the rebirth of Europe's biggest and richest nation. This is BBC News, our main story this hour. After the earthquake, Indonesia says it's struggling to reach survivors of a tsunami which has so far claimed more than 400 lives. And we can stay with that story. Our correspondent Richard Lister will explain now why Indonesia is prone to such devastating natural disasters. Aerial images of Indonesia's disaster zone show the reach and the power of the tsunami, a landscape scoured of buildings and people. It all starts here, on the seabed along the Pacific Rim. Sections of the Earth's crust grind together, causing volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. It's known as the Ring of Fire. This animation shows the location of every earthquake around the world over several years. 90% of them occurred along the Pacific Rim. And of all the countries on that Ring of Fire, Indonesia is seen as the most prone to earthquake damage. Not all undersea earthquakes cause tsunamis, but those measuring more than seven on the Richter scale pose a real threat. And when one tectonic plate is forced under another, as may have happened in Indonesia, the sudden change to the seabed displaces a huge volume of water, creating giant waves moving as fast as a jetliner. Under the right conditions, those waves can cross an ocean, this animation shows what happened in 2004 when an earthquake measuring 9.1 on the Richter scale generated a tsunami off Sumatra. It reached the African coast just seven hours later. A quarter of a million people were killed. But other factors can make smaller tsunamis deadly too. Look at this long inlet leading to Palu. Even though Friday's earthquake was much smaller than in 2004, this narrow inlet focused the energy of the waves as they raced towards the town. And it could be days before the authorities in Indonesia know just how much damage was done, how many lives were lost. Richard Lister, BBC News. Mediterranean cyclone Zorbas has triggered flash flooding across Greece, bringing heavy rainfall and strong winds to Athens, the central and northeastern Peloponnese and Evia. The storm, which is also known as a Medicaine, hit the southeast of the Peloponnese Peninsula the hardest, with the coastal capital of Kalamata and seaside villages being inundated by waves. The public has been advised to exercise caution and avoid unnecessary travel. Chris Fawkes from the BBC's Weather Centre explained the severity of the storm. The Medicaine has been swirling around the eastern Mediterranean for the last couple of days, picking up strength, but it was on Saturday that it made its landfall across the south of the Peloponnese area of uh, Greece. It brought torrential rain, we had localised severe flooding and large battering dangerous waves pummeled the coastline. 
Now this storm is going to continue to work northeastwards, the strongest winds easing away, but they'll be still strong enough to bring down a few tree branches as we head through Sunday. Torrential rain, the major threat. Now we could see 50 millimetres rain falling quite widely across Greece into western areas of Turkey. The wettest area is picking up 100 to 150 millimetres of rain, so there could be more flooding before the weather begins to improve. It's highly unusual for a country to change its name. But on Sunday, the people of Macedonia will decide whether to approve a proposal to rechristen their country North Macedonia. A yes vote would mean an end to the decades-long dispute with neighbouring Greece, who believe the name implies a territorial claim on part of Northern Greece. As Guy Deloni reports from the capital Skopje, it's a particularly important vote for the country's young people. Macedonia has spent much of the 21st century looking to ancient history. It splurged a fortune on recasting its capital as the cradle of civilization, appropriating Greek heroes and infuriating its southern neighbor. But now it's out with the old and time to look to the future, potentially at least. Sunday's referendum will see voters decide whether to rename the country North Macedonia. Turnout for a European Macedonia is the message on this referendum billboard. It says on the 30th of September will make a historic decision because changing its name would allow Macedonia to end its long-running dispute with Greece and the government says that would allow this small landlocked country to look to the future. We're a small country, small market without stability, without guarantee for security and uh, prosperity in economy. It's really Every day it's a new damage for the country because of migration, you go out. Macedonia's young people struggle in one of Europe's poorest countries. Low wages, lack of opportunities and rampant corruption force many to leave. The organizers of this event say that's got to change. They are one of the largest marginalized groups in this country at the same time, struggling with a poor educational system, high unemployment, little opportunities for prosperity. They are desperate, we are desperate, to see an advancement toward a better, prosperous uh, environment and a democratic society in this country. There have been strident protests against the agreement with Greece. Some feel the government is giving up Macedonian identity. Others are simply unhappy about a lack of consultation. The problem with the agreement is that it's not, uh, it's pushed by a foreign party uh, onto Macedonia. It's not really something that the uh, people have debated, accepted uh, and uh, agreed upon. But some things have already changed. Skopje's airport is no longer named after Greek hero Alexander the Great. A yes vote on Sunday would bring a new identity to the whole country. Guy Delaune, BBC News, Skopje. Let's get some of the day's other news for you now. Riot police in Nicaragua have used stun grenades and tear gas to break up the latest protest against President Daniel Ortega. Opposition activists were gathering for a march in the capital Managua when the police moved in to enforce a ban on demonstrations. One journalist said he was beaten with a rifle butt as officers chased protesters through the streets. A court in Egypt has given a female activist who spoke out against sexual harassment a two-year jail sentence and a fine for spreading false news. Amal Fathi has been in detention since May when she posted a video on Facebook in which she criticised the government for not doing enough to protect women. Police in Barcelona have arrested six people during rival demonstrations relating to Catalonia's independence referendum. 24 people were injured in scuffles between people who backed Catalan independence and demonstrators showing their support for police who intervened last year when Catalonian leaders made a failed attempt to separate from Spain. Britain's governing Conservative Party has had to update its annual conference app after a security glitch resulted in pranksters phoning senior ministers. The breach allowed anyone to log in as a delegate simply by using an email address and access private details including mobile phone numbers. Several senior figures, including the former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, received prank calls after the glitch was uncovered. And police in Denmark say they've questioned and then released two people who were travelling in a black Volvo was at the centre of a major security alert on Friday. 
The operation brought parts of Denmark to a standstill. Two investigations are underway, but Danish police say there's no threat to the general public. Now in golf, Europe will go into the final day of the Ryder Cup with a four-point lead over the USA. It makes them strong favourites to win back the trophy, as Ben Croucher reports. The battle cry created in Scandinavia, the golf course in France, the rivalry created down the decades. The Ryder Cup is unmistakable. As the USA have found, though, it's easy to lose yourself. And as they found on Friday, it's easy to lose points too. Saturday's four balls carried on where the Friday foursomes finished. This cry created in Hollywood, County Down. For McElroy's experience and Tyrrell Hatton's relative lack of it, fairway or rough, little mattered as Europe surged clear in what was becoming an alarmingly one-sided event. Oh, but what a shot, what a shot from Tyrrell Hatton. Francesco Molinari and Tommy Fleetwood won their third point in as many matches. Sergio Garcia found some Spanish strength to see off Tony Finau and Brooks Kepka. But just when another European whitewash was on, Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas ensured they were here and heard. Still, the USA were staring at a heavy deficit. So when Henrik Stenson and Justin Rose were sent out first in the foursomes and claimed their customary points, the gap grew wider. That, under the circumstances, probably the putt of the day. Fleetwood and Molinari's putts may not have won such accolades, but with yet another point, they became Europe's fourth most successful pairing in just two days. The US was six behind and Tiger Woods still hadn't won a match. But undaunted by the chasm and the potential pitfalls plain to see at the Golf National, Spieth and Thomas sunk a strangely subdued McElroy and Ian Poulter with pinpoint precision. It will be 10-6 heading into Sunday's singles. Only twice before has a side come from so far behind to win. The US will have to summon the spirit of Brookline 99 if they're to create another piece of Ryder Cup history. Ben Croucher, BBC News. Dramatic footage has emerged of how passengers were rescued from an airliner which crashed into the sea in Micronesia. The Air New Guinea flight had 36 passengers and 11 crew on board when it missed the runway at Chuk International Airport. You can see people standing on the wings of the plane as rescuers approach on boats. Four people were seriously injured. There are no reports of any fatalities. Just a reminder of our top story then today. Rescue workers in the Indonesian city of Palu have been struggling to reach people trapped in the rubble of buildings that were brought down by Friday's earthquake. We know over 400 people have lost their lives. And we hear now from the official government spokesman that the Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, is travelling to Paolo today. He's set off uh, to go there. They are also saying that the difficulty of communications has been made worse because power lines and communication circuits have suffered in that natural disaster. More on that later. Thank you for watching. Hello there. Yesterday was a quiet day of weather here in the UK, but what a contrast across the eastern Mediterranean where we had this, the Medicaid. And it brought torrential rain in across southern Greece in the Peloponnese with some localised severe flooding. The rough seas causing a few light boats to be pushed on shore. One or two were also capsized in those rough seas, so we've had all kinds of weather impacts. Here in the UK, though, it's a beautiful end to the day yesterday. Crazy swan lady catching the sunset. We'll probably have a similar fine sunrise as well to start the day, particularly across the Midlands, East Anglia and South East England. That's where the clearest skies are. Further north and west, it stays quite blustery. A few showers to start the day for the north and west of Scotland. But underneath the combination of uh, clear skies and light winds across the southeast, it's here where temperatures will really dip down. So a cold start to the day for the early risers. Temperatures around two or three degrees Celsius. Now through Sunday, we do have a weather front on the pressure charts. It's a very weak one, pushing in across northern England and Wales, just really bringing a strip of cloud. But behind the front, the air does turn a little bit cooler. So temperatures perhaps a degree down on what we saw on Saturday. It will feel a bit cooler than that, though, due to the strength of the wind across Scotland, where there'll be plenty of blustery showers. Now, through the day for Northern Ireland, England and Wales, the cloud will tend to come and go. There'll be some bright or sunny spells. Probably not as much sunshine, though, as we enjoyed on Saturday, but not a bad kind of day. 
A few showers brought on the uh, northwesterly winds running onto the north coast of Northern Ireland and perhaps a few sneaking across the Isle of Man into the northwest of England and also the north of Wales. But otherwise, it's a, a fine and dry day for most of us. Temperatures for many between 12 and 15 degrees. Then as we look at the forecast through the night time, a ridge of high pressure builds in and that's how we start the day on Monday. What it does mean is it's going to be a chilly start to the day. Could have some pockets of frost in the coldest areas in the countryside, but a fair bit of sunshine. However, the weather clouds over and we will start to see some rain arriving in Scotland, particularly for the Western Isles, the Highlands and the Northern Isles as we go through the latter part of the day. Perhaps a little rain running onto the north coast of Northern Ireland, but still a mainly dry day for England, Wales and Northern Ireland with temperatures for many between 12 and 15 degrees. Now looking at the forecast deeper into the week ahead across northern areas, often quite cloudy and there will be a bit of rain at times, particularly in the northwest. It will stay quite breezy as well. Temperatures in Glasgow generally around 11 to 14 degrees in the week ahead. Perhaps a little bit of rain in Manchester, but by and large England and Wales having a lot of dry weather, but it will often be pretty cloudy. That's your forecast. Follow the story, whatever you're doing, wherever you are. You can follow every moment in depth with BBC News. Get the full story at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Get the headlines as they happen with the breaking news alert. And keep up with events by watching the BBC News channel in the app. Follow the story wherever you are with BBC News. There are unsung heroes in every community. They organise and support groups and clubs of all shapes and sizes. It's time to elevate your unsung hero to superhero. To nominate your Get Inspired Unsung Hero, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash unsung. When the weather can't decide what to do, you still can. To know what's coming, check the BBC Weather app. This is BBC News. Here are the headlines. The Indonesian President Joko Wikodo is travelling to the stricken city of Paulu today, where it's known that over 400 people have lost their lives in Friday's earthquake and tsunami. It's feared that many more people have perished. Rescuers have yet to reach the neighbouring coastal district of Dongala, which is home to 300,000 people. Elon Musk has agreed to stand down as chairman of the electric car maker Tesla and pay a $20 million fine. The case stems from a tweet in which he said he wanted to take the company back into private hands. And a woman in the far east of Russia has told the BBC she recognises one of the key suspects in the Salisbury on, Novichok attack as a decorated military officer. The BBC travelled to a village east of Moscow to validate research carried out by the Bellingcat website. Theresa May has arrived in Birmingham for the Conservative Party conference, which has experienced technical difficulties before it even began. Contact details, including mobile phone numbers of hundreds of MPs and journalists, were accidentally made accessible on their conference app, a problem which was later fixed. Our political correspondent Ben Wright is in Birmingham. This conference began with a pretty serious uh, security blunder. Anyone logging in to the conference app could have accessed an MP's phone number if they'd known what their email address was. Now, this glitch was fixed pretty quickly. The party had to apologise. But a bad start to a party conference that's going to be completely dominated, I think, by Brexit. Many Tories, of course, hate Theresa May's so-called checkers plan. And in the Sunday Times tomorrow, the former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson calls it a deranged plan and questions her commitment to Brexit. Now, Theresa May's allies are fighting back, and on the eve of this conference, I joined one cabinet minister, the Brexiteer, Andrea Leadsom, as she tried to drum up support for the Chequers plan among the party's own grassroots. I am fully backing this proposal. Selling the Prime Minister's Brexit plan, known as Chequers, to Conservative Party members in Leicester last night. It removes the need for infrastructure at the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland and it enables us to continue to trade in goods with the European Union without friction. 
Andrea Leadsom backed leave in the referendum, now sits in the cabinet and spent an hour fielding questions and concerns from the Tory grassroots. At what point do we decide to go forward with a no deal? There's a lot of uncertainty in business at the moment and we really do need to know where we're going and what we can plan for. Why are people saying the Canada deal is better than the deal which we have on the table? We will abide by... The Chequers' plan for trading with the EU after Brexit has been rubbished by Brexiteers like Boris Johnson and criticised by the EU. The reality is we are now running out of time. We have put forward a workable proposal that works for the UK and for the EU and they need to take it very seriously. But the splits in the Tory party are quite clear, aren't they? And they'll be evident in Birmingham. I mean, there, there are very strong opposing views, there's no doubt about that. But in the end, we all need to act in the interests of the country. We do need a good Brexit deal. We need to push the EU to give us that and not waste our um, arguments with each other, but actually have those arguments legitimately with the Commission. The arguments that will play out here are about much more than Tory party bickering and positioning. They are about the sort of country we'll be for years to come. The Prime Minister comes to Birmingham clutching on to her Chequers plan, hoping the EU and then Parliament will swing behind it. But first, she needs to rally her party. Is that a tough week ahead, Prime Minister? Ben Wright, BBC News, at the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham. Well, now on BBC News, it's time for Witness.